spent a few minutes going over the stuff that's going to be on tomorrow's test here right now. First thing that we started off with is this, in this unit, and the first thing, of course, that's going to appear on tomorrow's test, is the idea of electric charges. Okay, simple things right off the top. We have two types of charges. They're positive and negative. We know where they come from, right? We know that if you have a positive charge, it comes from having more protons than electrons. If you have a negative charge, it comes from having more electrons than protons. Simple stuff, right? The unit for charge, we've used that a million times by now. At the beginning of the unit, it might have been a little bit hard to remember, but now we use it so many times that everybody's going to remember the unit of charge is the coulomb. What are some of the other units that we sometimes see, though, for, for electric charge that are close to coulombs but not quite coulombs? What are the common ones that we see? Microcoulombs, right? That's a Looks like this. Another one we see is a nanocoulombs, okay? 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 9. Another one that we see, we have seen a, a few times, is a millicoulomb. That's 10 to the minus 3. You ever forget those conversion factors? They're always on your data sheet, so always go back to them. Remember that we've always got to be in coulombs when we do calculations, but that when we see questions, we often see things that are other than coulombs. It's because coulombs is a really, really big set of units. Not always convenient. We talked about the charges of various particles. Not that we have to remember them, but we have to be able to find them on our data sheet. If you look on the left-hand side, sorry, the right-hand side of your data sheet, it'll tell you that an electron has a charge of minus 1e, or a proton is plus 1e, or an alpha particle is plus 2e. What does that mean? What's minus 1e mean? What would the charge of that electron be? Yeah, it's negative 1 elementary charge, or negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, as opposed to this one, which would be positive 2 times the elementary charge, or 3.2 times 10 to the minus 19. Again, you don't need to remember those, although by now you probably have memorized some of them. You can always go back and check your data sheet. Okay, even if you think you remember them, it's not a bad idea to go back and check your data sheet just to make sure that you haven't made a mistake with them. There's a question on tomorrow's test, we've done this a few times already, two or three times already, where we need to find the number of electrons. Okay, I'm telling you right now, it's one of the questions on tomorrow's test. What's the number of electrons? How do you do that? I think we did an analogy the day that we started this, the day that we introduced this in class. I said something to the effect of an orange weighs a half a kilograms. We have a bag of oranges that weighs three kilograms. How many oranges are in the bag? What's the answer to that question? Six. How'd you get that? Sure you do. You yeah, that's exactly what you did, right? You said three kilograms is my total mass. I divided it by, divided it by the mass of one orange, 0 0.5 kilograms, and that gave me six oranges, right? Make sense? If I want to find a number of electrons, I'm not usually going to say the total mass divided by the mass of one electron. Rather, I'm going to say the total charge divided by the charge of one electron. So it would be the total charge, QT we'll call it, divided by the charge of one electron, which is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Whenever you're asked to find the number of anything in physics 30, it's always going to be the total something divided by the amount for one. So the total charge divided by the charge of one, the total mass, divided by the mass of one, the total energy, divided by the energy of one, total something, divided by the something for one. An electroscope, if you remember from the day in class we did that practice problem or the textbook problem, the electroscope has this, uh, this metal ball on the top, it's got this metal rod that goes down from that metal ball, and then it's got these two thin foil leaves that hang off the end of this metal rod. Uh, it's neutral. Okay, it starts off as neutral, so maybe we have an equal number of positives and negatives. Let's say it looks something like this. Okay, Even distribution of protons and electrons, at least more or less, throughout the, the parts of this electroscope. Let's see what happens. See what happens when we bring a negatively charged object nearby the ball of this electroscope. Tell me what's going to happen to the positives in this electroscope. They're going to stay where they are. What's going to happen to the negatives? 
they're going to be pushed down, right? So let's erase, let's erase uh, these negatives right here. Let's erase all the negatives and recognize that all these negatives, or at least a lot of these negatives, are going to go down to the leaves, as far away from that negatively charged object as it can be. Tell me what's going to happen to the leaves of this electroscope now. Cool? They're going to drift apart because we've got two negatively charged leaves. Like charges repel each other. Let's see what happens if we bring a positively charged object nearby. Once again, you've got positives and negatives everywhere. This time, though, the electrons that were scattered everywhere are going to be sucked to the top here. So you're going to get a bunch of extra negatives there. That's going to leave the ball of this electroscope negative, but it's going to leave the leaves what? Positive. What's going to happen to them this time? They're going to repel the same as they did over here. So an electroscope doesn't tell us what kind of charge we have. The leaves will repel whether it's positive or negative. It doesn't tell us how much we have. It just tells us that we have charge, either positive or negative. Let's go one step further with this, actually, while we're, while we're on it. What would happen if I grounded that? These electrons that want to go down to the leaves, because the leaves are the farthest place they can go away from this negatively charging object, they now don't go down into the leaves. They now go down into the ground. Because now the Earth is as far away as they can go. The Earth is further away than the leaves are, so they go down into the Earth. So now you've got a positively charged electroscope. Let's cut this. What happens? They stay there. They stay spread apart, right? Because the leaves are positively charged, and there's no way for them to lose that charge. So the way it was, I bring the negative object nearby, the leaves spread apart, I take it away, the leaves go back. But if I ground it, and then cut the ground wire, then the leaves will stay spread apart for an indefinite period of time. And next, we talked about conductors versus insulators. And we know that the difference is eh? conductors have electrons that are, aren't as tightly bound to the nucleus as they are in insulators. Some examples, of course, <coughs> aluminum, copper, gold, silver, metals, right? Insulators, wood, plastic, glass, non-metals. Metals tend to have con uh, electrons that aren't as tightly bound to the nucleus, and that's why they tend to be better conductors. Next, we talked about the laws of electricity, including that fourth law. They didn't really fit with the other ones, but... We'll put them together here. The three laws, opposite charges attract, like charges repel, and the third law, that third law, which is charged objects attract neutral objects. We talked about the cause of that, right? Charged objects attract neutral objects because of a temporary separation of charge. Here's my neutral object. Here's my charged object. Bring that nearby. It attracts not because... Not because this neutral object is charged, or not because it ever gains a charge, but because it pushes away, or sorry, it pulls towards it, the negative charges that are inside that neutral object. That leaves us with a separation of charge, where one side is positive and the other side is negative. The side that's closest to the charging object will always be opposite. So it's kind of like opposites attract, but it's not like the whole object is negative. The whole object is opposite. It's just the part that's closest is opposite. We also talked about the, the law of conservation of charge and how that kind of comes into play in some situations. These two things that you see on the, on the board here, just examples that we gave in class. You don't need to know anything per se about electrostatic painting and about electrostatic precipitators to filter out dust. Okay? You're not going to be asked a question on those per se. It's just the idea of working through those in our head, applying what we've learned about conservation of charge to, to understand those. What happens in this one? These neutral dust particles. 
they go through these negatively charged rods. As neutral touches negative, by the law of conservation of charge, they both become they both become negative. As the dust particles that are now negative go through these positively charged plates, the negative dust particles get attracted to the plates, and it sucks the or it filters out the dust out of the air. What do we have over here? Oh, we got this negatively charged rod that's inside this painter. When the neutral paint goes by this negatively charged rod, what happens? It becomes negative. It's conservation of charge, right? Neutral, negative touch, they become negative and negative. So now the paint droplets are negatively charged. They go towards this fence, what happens? They get attracted to it. Now this fence is grounded, so any kind of excess charge that you have doesn't stick around on the fence. You don't get shocked when you go and touch the fence. Right, the charge is drained through the ground, the paint sticks to the, sticks to the metal, sticks to the fence. Um, could you see an application like this tomorrow or on your diploma exam in a few months? Of course you could. Would it be one of these? Probably not. Okay, would it be something that you've never seen before? Probably. Okay, but that's okay. Because okay, we know all the laws that apply here, we just need to apply them to the situation. Talked about charging objects. Conduction and induction. Conduction, remember, always involved the charge transfer, always. Usually involved touching. Induction never involved a charge transfer, never involved conduction. We had to do the subcategories. Okay, friction, rubbing together, contact, touching two objects with different charges. They want to balance by the law of conservation of charge. You don't need to know about lightning, per se, either, any more than you do about electrostatic painting. But it's a good example. Before lightning strikes, say the bottom of the cloud is negative. Before lightning strikes, the ground down here will become positive. Because the negatives there get pushed away, way down into the Earth. So we get a temporary separation of charge, making the top of the Earth positive. That's before the lightning strikes. That's induction because there's no charge being transferred. As soon as the lightning starts striking, all of a sudden the negatives go down. That makes the Earth negatively charged. But that's not negative by induction, that's negative by conduction because charge has just been transferred. Lightning is the perfect example of this because it involves both induction and conduction. You going to see a question on lightning? Maybe, maybe not. You going to see a question on something else entirely new? that involves in induction and conduction? That's probably more likely. <laughs> Next, we talked about Coulomb's Law. And as we introduced Coulomb's, we talked about the torsion balance experiment. Remember, the idea was that we, we brought one charge nearby another charge. We observed how much the string twisted. We observed the force as a result of that. Plotted three graphs, four graphs, sorry. Three graphs. Force versus Q1. We found that it was a linear relationship. We plotted force versus Q2. We found that it was a linear relationship. We plotted force versus R, and we found that it was a it was an inverse square relationship. So F was related to Q1, F was related to Q2, F was related to the inverse of R squared. Hence the term inverse square relationship. Now, you tell me what variables I would have kept constant here in this first one. If I'm manipulating Q1, seeing what effect that has on F, what variables would I kept constant there in the first one? Q2 and R. Here it would have been Q1 and R. Here it would have been Q1 and Q2 that had to be kept constant. Put those three things together, F is related to Q1, F is related to Q2, F is related to 1 over R squared. We get a constant times Q1, Q2 over R squared. And that constant, as we know, is 8.99 times 10 to the minus, 10 to the positive 9 Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. We talked about Coulomb's law. What do we got to know about that? Obviously, if we have two charges here, find the force between them. 
find the acceleration if we need to by saying a is equal to f over m. If we have three charges in a row, then be able to find the force on any one of those three due to the other two. Draw a free body diagram. Calculate the forces, add them up. The third one, this is the harder one, but not too bad. If we have three charges like this at right angles, get the net force on the middle one. Okay, again, draw a free body diagram. Calculate each of the individual forces, add them up, but this time add them up according to the rules of vector addition, which includes a vector diagram along with um, Pythagorean theorem and the inverse tan function. And finally, what do we mean by this VVC, this variable value changing? If the original force is KQ1, Q2 over R squared, what does a new force become? After I make changes, K times Q1 times Q2 over 2R squared, or over 1 third R squared, or whatever changes I make to it. The one thing that I'll caution you with this is if you are changing the value of R to whatever, make sure you square the number. Okay, it becomes not over one half r squared, it becomes over one quarter r squared. Talked about electric fields. It's quite a bit to write down here, guys. You might not have time to finish this. Um, you can always go back and watch this and finish the notes here tonight, okay? Electric fields, we talked about the definition of it. We talked about the fact that it's a vector, skill, vector field. Uh, we talked about the fact that other fields, gravitational fields are vector fields. Things like light fields and heat fields are scalar fields. And what's the difference between a force and a field? Force requires an experience or a field doesn't. The direction is the way that a positive goes. In other words, it's from away from positive toward negative. The diagrams... Okay. I guarantee you right now, question number one on tomorrow's test is a picture of electric fields. Okay, and you have to tell me which picture is correct. Okay, so you've got a scenario with charges and the electric fields drawn around them. You have to tell me which one's right. The equations, remember we had the producer equation, the experiencer equation, and then the parallel plate equation. Remember that little Venn diagram we had showing when each of them was, was able to be used. Non-uniform fields, uniform fields. Here's two charges. What's the net field right here? Remember, just same as with forces. Draw a picture, draw a diagram, calculate the fields, add them up. And then we talked about charge distribution. Where do the charges, where do the excess electrons always go on something? They always go to the outer surface. Always, right? They always go to the outer surface. If it's a uniform thing like a sphere or a, a solid flat conducting plate, they all end up being evenly spaced. If it's pointy, then what happens? They're more concentrated towards the point than they are the, the uniform sections. We talked about electric potential energy, energy difference, potential, potential difference. Remember, that's what we did the other day. None of these terms are all incredibly confusing. It's just when you start introducing them all together. Remember, energy is E and delta E. Potential is V and delta V. So when you're looking for energy, make sure it has an E in it. When you're not looking for energy, make sure it has a V in it. Finally, be able to, be able to convert electron volts to joules, by the way. And then finally, in question number nine, this is what we've been doing Friday and today. This is the charged particles accelerating in fields, speeding up, slowing down, car going down the hill, car going up the hill. Does that make sense? Those last couple topics are pretty quick, just because of time here. Take a look at this tonight if you need to write down some more stuff. Okay, watch, watch the podcast tonight. It'll be up by about four. And uh, let me know if you have any questions tomorrow. Okay.